What's up, what's up, what's up, Big Connect? How we doing? What's good, beautiful people? Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Checkpoint Church. Early gang. Go drop in general that we're live. Discussion on the Midnight Club starts now. Get over here at chat. And we'll do a Midnight Club gift. Spookum gift. There we go. Nice, dude. What's up, folks? Welcome in. We are doing the best we can this morning. I actually need to go set up real quickly something, so you're gonna you're gonna see me um, vanish for just a moment. But I promise I'm still here. Maybe you can still hear me. Uh, but I need to. Ba -ba 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 -ba. I need to do this right there. Whatever the weather's. Boom. I forgot to load that. But now we're good. Now it is loaded. Welcome in, folks. This is Checkpoint Church, Church for Nerds, Geeks, and Gamers. On Wednesdays, we host our Nerdy Sermon Talk Back. We're going to be talking about the Midnight Club. That was our most recent Nerdy Sermon over on our YouTube channel, exclamation point, uh, exclamation point YouTube, if you ever want to follow that. Subscribe to us. Get us to 1,000 subscribers so that we can do more things on that channel. Um, we, we, I, I enjoy that channel a lot, and I think we put out some great hashtag content. So I'd love your support over there. If you're not subscribed to us already, be sure to go and do that. If you are subscribed, make sure you click on uh, the little bell to know whenever we go live. Except maybe don't. <laughs> I actually, so I learned the other day, uh, according to the uh, YouTube algorithm professionals, that if you click the notification bell, but you don't click the video, so if it notifies you and you don't click on the video, that is a demerit on your CTR. Isn't that interesting? Why would they do that? What are they thinking? <laughs> they incentivize you with the bell and then and then harm you with the bell in one, one fell swoop. Zando's first, everybody. I'm sorry to say it. Anybody who was hoping to be first, bummer, dude. Zando's first. That's just the way it is. Blue, blue, blue. Things will never be the same. All right, folks. About to run and take the kids to school. I'll be back to redeem my usuals a little later. All good. About 9.05, we'll play our song to get us centered for today. And then we'll go straight from the song into our video as usual. I actually do have a question of the day. Question of the day. We kind of already asked it over on the Discord. But for folks that are joining us here for this nerdy sermon is, what is your favorite horror franchise? Favorite horror franchise. What is, what is primo horror content for you? I, uh, my answer is probably always going to be Danganronpa if it's like, if games are allowed. That's my favorite horror genre, anything. I love psychological horror. I love a lot of things, but that's always been one of my favorites. Ooh, Lo-Fi Tank. I love it. I don't think I've heard this one before. That's very nice. Good morning. I'm here, but flying solo at work today, so I'll be running around. I got you, Sneaky. You're all good. You're all good. We're happy you're here, whether you're lurking or whether you're active or wherever it may be. We're happy that you are here. See, I guess I could turn on a timer for when the video or the song's going to start. That'd be nice, huh? Put a little timer. This is just our little, like, um, starting soon. None. Not a scary movie person. I hear that, Chuck. Chuck, I thought of you the other day. I made a TikTok that made me think of you. Um, if you are not on TikTok, Tink tank. They, uh, there's a trending thing going around right now in the anime scene where it's this girl repeating the same thing over and over again to show that anime tropes exist and that uh, so many anime are the same thing. And she says, uh, what is it? What is the actual phrasing? I'll play the actual like quote. Let's see if I can find it. Whoopsie. Gotta go over to our TikTok. Folks, if you're not following us on TikTok, 
we're pretty active there. I'm trying to post regularly so that I can lean into that demographic as much as I loathe TikTok. Okay. This is so this is the sound, okay? Anime where the main character almost dies and then a supernatural entity is put inside of him and now he is the bridge between two worlds. Did you hear that? Anime where the main character almost dies and then a supernatural entity is put inside of him and now he is the bridge between two worlds. So, given the fact that I think that you would care, I'm sure you can imagine what I did. My last my last one was of course Chuck. <laughs> Because it's that's totally the plot of Chuck! <laughs> and I love it so much! Ah, Chuck's an anime, you guys. We didn't even know that Chuck was anime. But Chuck is anime. The more you know. Hashtag the more you know. What's up, T-Bone? You getting ready for work? Thank you for the follow, by the way, Chuck. Appreciate you. Preach. It's kind of a it's kind of a hodgepodge. Honestly, what I'm finding right now with TikTok that is so surprising is that the TikTok community that I don't know, so people that are just finding us haphazardly and randomly, are finding us via our sermons, which is so weird. Like I I didn't even think I was going to post sermons on there because I'm like they're way too long um, for TikTok. We can post up to ten minutes because of the follower count that we have, uh, but I try to like edit them down pretty concise to like seven or eight minutes. And people are watching them. And not only are they watching them, they're saving them. And I'm so intrigued. I'm so curious about like, why? Why are people wanting to watch our sermons on TikTok? Very intriguing. So I'm I'm curious about the whole platform. Uh, a part of me wants to try streaming on there or like whenever we're streaming like this right now, doing a live stream and like holding the camera right here. But I don't know. I don't know, dude, I'm too scared. I'm too scared. Stained, are you here? I see your, I see your, your, um, that Pokemon that shall not be named floating around. Cause I got so many questions. I learned today that Stained did not grow up with the acrostic for jerk and cool whenever we were kids. And now I want to know who knows it and who doesn't know it. I tweeted about it and I thought that everybody was going to be like, oh, that was so crazy. But Stained was like, what are you talking about? What life did you live? Never heard of it. So whenever you would be called, whenever you were a kid and you would be called a jerk, you would say, or, or you would be like, uh, uh, well, yeah, yeah, I am a jerk because jerk stands for uh, junior educated rich kid. And I think you're cool, which stands for a uh, uh, constipated, overweight, out of style loser. And that was what you would always say. That was like the thing. But now, you know, 20 some odd years later, I'm reflecting on the fact that junior educated rich kid means nothing. What does junior educated even mean? Junior educated is not is not a thing. Now rich kid is pretty obvious, and educated is even obvious. But why the junior? Did you just did they, did they have to make the J work? Why couldn't they just change it? Definitely not a thing. I'm blown away. Now I like I need to ask everyone. I'm probably gonna make a TikTok about it. Speaking of TikTok, heading off to work. See you, T Bone. Thanks for saying hello. Yeah, probably gonna have to make a TikTok about that because now I'm. Now I'm curious. As soon as that happens, I gotta know. I gotta know who knows and who doesn't know. Makes me so painfully curious. All right, I also need to add the song for today. I realize that's not up. Trombone, did you grow up with kids saying, yeah, I'm a jerk, a junior educated rich kid? And or uh, and you're cool, a constipated, overweight, out of style loser, because you're around my age. So maybe it was just our, maybe it was a maybe it was a millennial thing, or a young millennial thing. Kachow, kachow. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and play our song and get into a state of contemplation. So folks, the plan: no to the jerk, but yes to the cool. I'm tr I'm so intrigued. I'm gonna go ahead and give us a quick listen to make sure that we're all on the same page. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna have to make a TikTok about that. I'm definitely gonna have to know who has and who has not heard Junior Educated Rich Kid. So curious. So curious. 
Let's give ourselves a good listen. Folks, the way we treat this Wednesday stream is this is the closest thing we have to worship service, to be honest. Um, and so we're going to sing, uh, I'm going to sing a song, but purely, I didn't grow, well, I did actually. We were we were blended, man. We were blended. We were. It was a fascinating county. If you ever want to talk about my high school uh, experience, high school, middle school, and elementary school, the town that I grew up in was baffling. So I'd love to talk about it sometime. Anyway, um, what was I saying? We're going to start with a song. Uh, you don't have to sing along unless you just want to, but this is an opportunity for us to kind of center ourselves because this is more spiritual than most of the things that we do here on Checkpoint, uh, the stream, as far as that is concerned. So this is just an opportunity for us to kind of take our, you know, I don't know where you're coming from. I don't know if you've been watching streams this morning already. I don't know what's been going on in your morning. So this is a time for you to enter into a place of like, all right, we're moving from this place to talk about the Midnight Club to watch a sermon to experience a time of worship together. So that's all to say that the song will be up on the screen. If you want to sing along, you can. I know how weird it is to sing with a stream, to sing with a Zoom, to sing with any of that stuff. So I'm not going to ask you to. It's purely an opportunity, purely a thing that you can choose to do or not to do by your own accord. Yeah. We're going to do a quick sound check, though, just to make sure that we're all kosher. An oldie, an oldie, Matt Redman, man. It's going to be here for you. Lyrics will be up on the screen. Again, if you want to use them, use them. If not, please do not feel the need to. Sounds pretty nice. Do quick, quick again, sound. Let your praise be our welcome. Yep, that sounds fine. That sounds fine. Goodbye to Spoofy. We're going to go ahead and begin this, and then we're going to go almost immediately into the sermon. So I will, I will finish the song, and then I will click on our theater, and we will go straight to watching the sermon together. And then we'll come back, and we'll have questions and engagement and discussion time. So I'll be in the chat the whole time. And I uh, look forward to talking to you and hearing from you there. It's been a long time. Been a long time in the rock and roll. That, that and then Matt Redman, huh? Uh, but it is a goodie. It's a goodie. So here we go. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are you for you. We are you for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your life. We are you for you. We are you for you. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire you alone are holy only you are worthy god let your fire fall down let our shout be your anthem your renown fill the skies we are you for you we are you for you Let your word move in power. Let what's dead come to life. We are here for you. We are here for you. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hid, and you are our one desire. You alone our hope. Let your fire fall down. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, 
was playing To you our hearts are open Nothing else is hidden You are our one desire You alone are holy Only you are worthy God, let your fire fall down To you our hearts are open Nothing here is hidden You are our one desire You alone are holy Only you are worthy God, let your fire fall down And let our praise be your welcome Let our songs be a sign We are you for you we are you for you. Whenever the weather starts to get cold, I start to anticipate whatever Mike Flanagan is going to do next. But whenever I learned his next show was going to be about terminal children in a hospice center, I wasn't so sure. Nevertheless, I gave the Midnight Club a chance, and I'm glad that I did, because it might just be one of my favorite examples of why our Christian testimony is so important. If you're a fan of those times when Mike Flanagan accidentally stumbles into a conversation about faith that's a pretty good example of how faith could be better and more like Jesus, then this is the perfect show for you. So what does a horror show about terminally ill children in a miraculous hospice center have to do with our conversations and stories as Christians? Let's talk about it. Folks, welcome to Checkpoint Church, where nerds, geeks, and gamers come together to talk about faith games, and apparently it's just cool now to sneak off to the library at midnight, but when I go read books at midnight, I'm the weird kid. Welcome to your first official night in the Midnight Club. I'm your nerd pastor, Nate, and if you like these weekly deep dives, be sure to sub, hit that bell, and find out when our next one drops. Folks, as always, we're going to start this one with our scripture for today. Our scripture comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 18 through 27. We're going to have one of our level two members read this as we've been doing for a little while now. They're going to be reading from the NRSV UE. That's our preferred translation here at Checkpoints. What's going to be on the screen. If you have a translation that you prefer to use, feel free to use that one as well. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Zando, also known as Matt, uh, which is weird to even call him that. He's Zando. But take it away, Zando. If the world hates you, be aware that it hated me before it hated you. If you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own, because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, slaves are not greater than their master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But they will do all of these things to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not have sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. It was to fulfill the word that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify, because you have been with me from the beginning. Let's start out with the obvious. What is the Midnight Club? This is the latest in the Mike Flanagan universe, Flaniverse, I guess, on Netflix, including others such as The Haunting of Hill House, Bly Manor, and last year's viral Midnight Mass that we had a sermon on. I have been a diehard fan since discovering him then and was incredibly excited for his latest project until I heard the subject matter. We look forward to helping you write your own ending. Based on a book of the same name, Flanagan's Midnight Club was set to cover the mystery around the Bright Cliff Hospice. Yes, hospice for children. Yes, children. So given my love of Flanagan's gore, brutal deaths, and terrifying hauntings, I wasn't super excited to see children being haunted, let alone terminal ones. I was skeptical, but I trusted that Flanagan knew what he was doing. I believed in this guy. He's not let me down yet, so... Fingers crossed. And it was only one episode in that I realized this wasn't your usual horror flick. In fact, it wasn't really horror at all. It was more of a drama and a mystery. The show follows Alonka, a young girl who is diagnosed with cancer and later found to be terminal. She does some research and discovers the Brightcliff Hospice, known for providing excellent in-home care for children like her. But secretly, 
is known for a spotty history of healing patients miraculously under a previous ownership. Determined to find some way to survive, Alonka convinces her foster father to let her live out the rest of her days there while actually hoping to discover something more. When she arrives, she meets her fellow housemates who are a delightful mod podge of fantastic characters with charming backstories and lovable personalities most of them, anyways. During her first night's stay, Alonka hears her roommate leave around midnight and follows to discover that the other kids are sneaking to the library at night to tell fantastic and horrific stories to one another as members of the titular da -da -da -da, Midnight Club. Alonka joins their ranks and learns that their ultimate goal is actually to prove the existence of the afterlife. They make an oath upon joining that whoever dies first will make some kind of noticeable disturbance and haunt those remaining as a sign that something better exists after death. As if this isn't weirdly sad enough, it becomes pretty clear that all the stories that they tell are just echoes of their deepest feelings and fears personified in the act of horror storytelling. In this way, the show has several running threads at once, containing multiple anthologies through the stories told by the Midnight Club, the history of the Midnight Club and Brightcliff Hospice serving as one thread line, and Alonka's personal mission to find out more about the miracle of the decades prior being the final storyline. It's a great show and we still have a ton of big questions at the end of season two and I haven't heard near enough about it. Makes me crazy nervous that we're not gonna be getting that season two. So if you could please just go spam that on Netflix for the next few weeks, I guess, that would be really great. But what really stood out to me in this show was the method and importance of the storytelling itself. Like I mentioned a moment ago, each of the horror stories serves more than just the purpose of allowing Flanagan to flex his horror and disturbing imagery muscles. There are also parallels of the psyche of each of the members of the Midnight Club. For instance, Anya, Alonka's sassy roommate, tells the story of the two Danas, where a young girl Dana is cursed by the devil with the power to split herself into two versions of herself so that she can live the two lives that she wants to live. One where she's perfect and gets to be the dancer that she always dreamt of being, and then the other where she gets to party and live the wild and reckless life that she envies. The catch is that they physically experience whatever the other Dana is experiencing, leading to the good Dana being intoxicated on her big dance recital date and enduring withdrawal from harder drugs later on. We later learned that Anya was also a dancer and that the guy who is so concerned for good Dana in the story and expresses so much care for her is based on a real person that Anya wishes she could be closer to but pushes away because of her illness. Each story, one by one, borrows elements from the real life character to tell a deeper seated fear in the life of the story. Storyteller. Now, this is just plain old good storytelling, but even more importantly, it leads to a greater understanding of our lives as Christians and why our stories are so important. In the passage for this video, we looked at the conversation between Jesus and the disciples before Jesus would ascend into heaven and leave them to do the work of building the early church. Jesus explains that this will not make them popular, more like downright hated, just as Jesus was hated. This is because it isn't the goal to belong to the world, but instead to do the hard work that Jesus started. We're called to serve Jesus. Jesus and live the same life that he lived on earth. And that was a life of, well, persecution and hate and ultimately his death, right? Jesus even says that this hatred is without cause. It's literally just the way it is. Now imagine as Jesus was saying this, the disciples were looking a little freaked out about this whole hatred. And maybe you are too, if you're listening to this and thinking, you know what? I, I don't really want to be hated. So maybe this Christianity thing isn't for me. So Jesus explains to ease their fears a little bit that though he might be leaving, there'll be an advocate who will come to dwell among us, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth sent directly unto us from God. Now, why does this matter? Well, the work of the spirit is actually twofold. First, the Spirit will work in the hearts of those who hate Jesus and ergo hate us. It will do this by testifying to the truth of God before they were ever to meet us. In Methodism, we actually call this prevenient grace. But the Spirit also will dwell within us and help us along the journey. That doesn't put us off the hook. Jesus says that we are also to testify through the Spirit within us. Why? Because, well, similar to the reasons the disciples were called. Jesus said, you're called because you've been with me from the beginning. In other words, you know me, so you get to share me as well. In this way, we know Jesus and we're given the opportunity to share Jesus. Jesus needs the testimony of the disciples to continue sharing the message with those who haven't gotten the chance to know Jesus yet. And guess what? We are called to that exact same standard. We are called to be the testimony of Jesus to the world. Now, what else do we know about Jesus? Well, Jesus is God and we're made in the image of God. We are reflections of God. And when we own that relationship with Jesus and accept him as our savior, then an even greater thing happens. We become one and whole again, not perfect yet, but on our way towards perfection. 
This means that we become an echo of the greatest story ever told. We become a testimony of what Jesus did, has done, and is doing. There are elements of my life and every Christian's life that are echoes of the story of Jesus. And Jesus compels us to tell that story to those who are not yet in the faith. And we call this testimony. Now, this is a crazy popular Christianese word, but maybe it's one you're not familiar with, or maybe it's one that makes you uncomfy because of how more toxic churches have misused it in the past. Ultimately, it is exactly what the kids in Midnight Club are doing, only it's not fiction and it's hopefully not horror. Jesus had a story to tell, a message to share. When it was his turn to stand at the Midnight Club table and share, he started to tell the story, but it was all about you. It was the goodness you've seen, the kindness you've shared, the life you've lived, and those that you've met. You are Jesus's story. Each and every person who enters into that relationship becomes another echo of Jesus in this earthly existence. Your story is important and needed and valid and deserves to be heard. No, it must be heard. Jesus needs you to testify because someone is out there waiting to hear your message, your life, your instance of him in the world. That is our testimony. It could be as simple as a hardship you've overcome. It could be as challenging as trauma recovery. The way that our testimony forms is different for everyone because everyone might need a different thing to latch onto to find Jesus to be a perfect fit for them. So what does this actually mean for us today? What can we do with knowing that we need to have this testimony to be able to deliver? Well, just like the kids from the Midnight Club, we take the stand. Maybe we find the right group in the right spot and tell our story. Maybe we start with just one good person who will listen and love us, but we have to start telling our story. Your testimony, your relationship with Jesus, it's important. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus yet, this might be a chance to ask people that you know to share their testimony with you if they're ready. So often we talk about Jesus, but it's rare we're given the chance to actually share why Jesus matters to us. Ask them. Maybe you'll discover a Jesus that you didn't get to see before through others. Most importantly, know that this may be a calling, but it's not on your shoulders. The Holy Spirit has already started the work and we don't do the saving anyway. It's not on you to save souls or compete to see how many people can hear your testimony. It's about sharing your story when it's the right time to tell it. This really is just the bare bones of what I could talk about in this show. There is so much goodness. One topic I took on over on Rethink Church will be linked down below on how the Midnight Club accidentally is kind of about communion. It's just... It's just so good, I hate that it's being slept on. Regardless of any of that, whether you're just trying to survive, lashing out to find something to hold on to, or just trying to avoid making a tough decision, know that you're always welcome to share your testimony here or to hear one of ours at Checkpoint Church. Folks, thank you so much for watching this video. I so appreciate you taking time out of your- There we go. Cool, cool, cool. Well, folks, I hope that you enjoyed that nerdy sermon. It's always fun to get to put those together and to talk about those. If it wasn't, like I said in the chat, if it wasn't readily apparent, um, yeah. You wanted to see the ditto get highlight? I mean, I could, I could skip straight to it. I tried it, I tried it, I feel like the ending has no purpose. Whatever the weather starts- I can, I can skip right to it. Right there. How many packs of Pokemon cards I've unboxed? Just for Pokemon Go. It has to be in the 70s, 80s even. So unreasonably. I have tried so hard for this stinking card, dude. All I've wanted. <laughs> well, I think at this point, I think at this point, the reason there was no no facial recognition was because it was just. Oh, it had just been such a long journey. It had just been such a long journey. There was no excitement left to give. But yes. Thank you to those of you that turned up today and for those that watched through our Nerdy Sermon together. I hope that uh, you're enjoying these Nerdy Sermon talkbacks. I've missed them, actually. I don't know about you guys, um, but the past couple weeks I've been out of town on Wednesdays, and so I haven't been able to do them. Um, but I miss them like crazy. I, I, I'm really enjoying these times together. I feel like I should cut it in half and then insane cackling. Maybe, yeah, odds are Nikki might put that one in next week. I don't know though. We've had some we've had some good bits from the breakers yesterday, so maybe she'll use those. There's no telling. There is no telling. But yes, 
Happy that you're here. Happy that you're tuning in with us, folks. This is a time of open conversation. So if you have any thoughts or questions about Checkpoint, about the Midnight Club sermon, um, about me as Nerd Pastor Nate, about conversations going on in the chat, uh, about Zando's uh, uh, handsome self and adequate reading in the uh, scripture section, uh, anything, everything, whatever you want to bring up, let's talk about it. I'm, 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 it is fair game. This is an open time of conversation for whatever we're feeling about talking about today. Do you think if there's a second Midnight Club season, they'll finally start racing cars? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. You know, I've never played a Midnight Club. I have never played a single one. I have no idea what the games are or what they are like. I don't know if they're good car racing games. I know nothing. They were fun? That's good to know. That's good to know. Maybe I'll check them out someday. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Sneaky said, uh, I asked earlier if there were any Flanagans, any Flanagan fans out there. I'm obsessed uh, with Mike Flanagan. Uh, It happened last year with Midnight Mass. I'd never heard of him before. And then I watched Midnight Mass and I got so hooked on that show that then I had to watch everything he's ever done. And I found most of it. There were like one or two of his very early projects that I couldn't find, but I've I've consumed everything the man has ever made. And I love it. Love all his stuff. The only racing game that wasn't Mario Kart that I've ever gotten into was Burnout Paradise. I used to play the occasional racing game, but definitely not many. Definitely not many. But Sneaky Head Midnight Club is his first Flanagan. Enjoying this one, I'll go back and watch the others when I finish the club. Let me tell you, they're very different. Um, what is a hallmark of Mike Flanagan for me is that as far as I know, and I kind of, I kind of like hint at it in the sermon, uh, as far as I know, Flanagan is not a Christian. Um, but man, man, does he do an excellent job at exploring Christian themes and talking about how they are how Christians are are wrong. (laughs) He explores things that Jesus says in a really good way um, and is unafraid to to really lash out. Ex-Catholic, there you go. So there you go. That explains why he knows as much as he does. Zando, to answer your question, no, they do not all have midnight in them. But he does do a lot of title play. So he has what's, what's kind of known as his, like, The Haunting series, and they're all The Haunting of blah, blah, blah. And that's something that he likes to do. And then this is two in the Midnight series, which is kind of interesting. But the Midnight Club is actually not his original content, whereas the others, well, that's not actually true. Not not, not all of them are his content. I think, I don't even think, I don't, mm, Midnight Mass was his. Midnight Mass was his, as far as I can recall. But The Haunting of Bly Manor is based on the turning of the screw, maybe? Um, and the next one that he has is based on uh, Edgar Allan Poe's ah, I, I could remember if I if I wasn't trying to think of it and then Hill House I think might have been his no no nope it's on it's The Haunting of Hill House is a book it's a really old book not really old 19th 20th century early 20th late 19th century so a lot of the material that he takes is, is borrowed and adapted um but man, he just presents it in such a good way, and he does such a good character study. Um, you, if you watch Midnight Mass, that would probably be my recommendation, Sneaky. If you're enjoying this, I would recommend Midnight Mass next. Be prepared for more gore. Uh, it's gonna be all, it's it's a whole lot gorier than um, than this was. Less jump scares probably, but definitely more gore. And there's one episode in particular that is so. Good. They have such a good conversation about heaven and death um, that that's what I mean whenever I say that this show is basically that scene, uh, but every every episode is that. He kind of took his formula and he reversed it. So normally he has really good spiritual religious themes uh, tied in to his gore. Uh, this took really good religious and spiritual themes and and then tied the gore in so he kind of threw it on his head but that'd be my recommendation would be midnight mass next such a good exploration oh i find it interesting so for the article that i wrote for rethink 
Um, I talked about communion, but Midnight Mass is definitely a better uh, exploration of communion. Uh, and man, he makes some big arguments about that, doesn't he? Ugh, it's so good. Mike, Mike, you're a genius. Great writer, great director, great stuff. Highly recommend. I would highly recommend. Burnout 3 Takedown is the best Burnout game. I have no take. I think I've played precisely one Burnout, and it was purely for my 1001 games list, and I didn't really, like, dive too deep into it. Let's see, was there anything else that I didn't look at? Didn't respond to? The song was quite appropriate. It had been a while since I'd heard some Matt Redman, but... Uh, the whole idea of our testimony being a thing that we do as a kind of response to Christ. We are here for you. We are here for you, right? Talking about this is, this is our, this is our offering. Our testimony is our offering, our echo of Christ in the world. What are we talking about? What's up, Will Singley? Welcome in. Uh, we're talking about Midnight Club. It's our latest nerdy sermon. We just watched it just a little bit ago. And now it's just kind of an open AMA about any questions about the Midnight Club, about the sermon, uh, about Checkpoint Church, about myself, about, uh, we talked about testimony a lot in the sermon. So talking about our testimony. A good question might be um, to offer up your testimony if you have one. Even if you, maybe if we're uncomfortable offering up a whole testimony, it could just be, what was the first time? What was the first time that you experienced uh, any kind of, of Christ-like experience, any kind of Jesus moment? Mine was at Christian camp. Um, uh, I went to a Christian camp called Camp Marywood in Clemens, North Carolina, every single year in elementary school. So pretty much third grade, maybe even second grade, second and third grade up until middle school. And uh, they, it was very, very, very evangelical, um, uh, charismatic experience where the songs were emotive and an altar call every night and all of that kind of stuff, which was very different for me growing up Methodist. Um, but I did experience the, the, kind of, the kind of calling there. I think I had already had it kind of placed in my heart. I was way too young, by the way. Nine, nine years old is too young to receive a calling to serve the ministry. Um, with the pastorate, but it is what it is. And it was, uh, during those conversations during that time of just seeing all these, all these, uh, you know, there's a part of me that almost puts it into my current story of like checkpoint, like the fact that checkpoint exists is because of the fact that I, I like found my calling amongst a bunch of nerdy kids. Uh, I think that worked out of my favor. Maybe some cookie in that butt, Sean. It's almost like God knew what God was doing. Almost. Almost like there's a thread that ties. A bind that ties. First gotcha upon here for Zandu. Beans! It's the good bean, too. It's a toothpaste bean. I'll take it. All right, and now for Kuro. This guy chop on his way past cool. Gotta go fast cool. and see what's inside. Way past cool. Kuro, you have a doodle request. 90 second doodle request. You tell me what you want me to draw and I'll give my, my old college try. My best college try. Zando, I assume you're choosing right. Would you let me know? Right or left, my friend. That's right. Okay, right bean, toothpaste bean or blueberry. Toothpaste. Such a good bean. Such a good bean. The best bean. Mmm. Movie, movie game. Then I'll draw one shot. Nika, nika, ni. All right. Zando. Your movie, movie game is. Ooh, ooh, I don't know, dude. I'm not sure how the right bean is always the bad bean, but I love it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I do not, I do not, I do not. I did not hit her. I do not like it. Oh, hi, Mark. Okay. 
Thanks for all the fish, screamed a murderous good guy doll's creepy offspring. Thanks for all the fish, screamed a murderous good guy doll's creepy offspring. Now these are two that if you know them, you know them. If you know them, you know them. All right, let's look up a quick, quick pick. Quick pick, Nico. Okay. Is he doing anything or is it just an adorable little picture of him? Uh, I came to know Christ around seven years old at VBS. The summer after my senior year of high school, God called me to do child psychology. I'm now in college getting uh, towards my bachelor's degree in psych. That's awesome. Again, I think that's so interesting how God kind of works it all, right? I mean, there's a, there's a certain connection happening there of like knowing knowing Jesus at such a young age and then feeling called to work with and for children. That's There's something powerful there. There's something powerful happening. Okay, Google, set a 90-second timer. One minute and 30 seconds. Starting Let's see his hair, his hair. Well, and in all fairness, it may not be a connection that's there for you, but I just think it's interesting from the outside looking in. No timer. This word. This. This. Good. 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 All right. There's Nico. He's holding up the. He's holding up the light, and he's like, "Ha!" Ah! There you go. There's your 90 second Nico. 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 Okay. Let's see. Google retraining worked. Very good. I feel like I know them, but I can't figure out how they go together. Is this one I'm gonna be mad at? Mm -hmm. Definitely for the first one. The second one uh, could be either way. Oh, you got it. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy Seed of Chucky. The Seed of Chucky is the is the tough one because I would have thought Child's Play. You're not happy? I like that one. Galaxy Seed of Chucky. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Granted, the Seed does make it a little bit difficult because it's not Guardians of the Gal or not Guardians. <laughs> Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy Seed. But I don't mind that one. I think that one's fine. But chat's in the clap. Chat's in the clap because you got it. Son of Chucky. Nope. Seed. But yeah. If anybody else feels comfy, share share the first time that you met Jesus. First time that you really got it. I'm always intrigued. There's a very different relationship um, as, I've, as I've served in the ministry for as many years as I've had between people that grew up in the church and people that did not grow up in the church. Um, I'm not gonna lie, the people that did not grow up in the church, to me, always have a very strong, very strong um, faith. Uh, whereas people that maybe grew up in the church, we have a faith, but it's kind of always been there. And so it's not like it's shaky, but it's just not as like profound. There's something, there's, there's a profoundness to the first moment uh, whenever you experience it as an adult. 
And I say that as somebody that grew up in the church. I think my, I think my story is humble. Uh, and very much like I did have, I had that experience in, in the Christian camp. But again, it's kind of something that has continued to blossom. I actually ran from it for a long time and tried my darndest to be anything but a pastor uh, until finally just giving in in high school. Thanks for the lurk. Appreciate you, Sneaky. Got to go start an exam. Give them all A's. Give everybody an A. Give everybody an A for me, Sneak. Going to say that. I grew up in it, but it wasn't real until the last few years. Yeah, it's tricky. It's tricky. I've given myself the grace to not not say like it was real or wasn't real, but instead just like it was very much that like feeling of, of uh, I knew it almost felt like a provenient sort of grace. So I grew up in the Methodist church, grew up at PK, and we used to always do this thing. You can only be baptized once, right? This is a this is a Methodist doctrine. It's most Protestant doctrine. Most people, pretty much every Christian believes you can only be baptized once um, because God doesn't mess up. God doesn't make mistakes. But what you can do is as an effort of rekindling your side of the sacrament is you can uh, be reaffirmed. And so my dad used to always take us on two trips for confirmation every single year. We'd go to the beach house that we owned um, back in the day. And we would go twice a year to Oak Island in North Carolina, and we would spend a long weekend at the beach. I'm going to go to the beach, right? And so I would go and I would go to the beach and I'd have fun with all my friends. I'd be there with the with the youth kids. I would have such a great experience there. And I would feel so full of the spirit in those moments that I would come home and on Sunday they would have baptism and you could be baptized or reaffirm. But I loved being reaffirmed. And so I have been, I've been <laughs> baptized once, but I bet you I have been reaffirmed uh, more than 20 times probably more than 20 times because I just loved that experience. Now there was kind of a moment where it took like a shift of like, maybe, maybe you don't need, maybe you don't need it again. Maybe you don't need to reaffirm it again. Maybe you've, maybe you have affirmed it. There was like one affirmation that took, you know what I mean? There was one affirmation that took. Uh, let's see. You have these high moments being in church every day as a kid, but when you're on your own and realize you can choose to go to church or not, that's when it becomes a more personal relationship for me. Chose not to do much at first and circumstances brought me back. I hear that. So that's something that we are seeing in uh, Gen X and Millennials. Gen Z hasn't uh, had time, obviously, to do the study, but Gen X and Millennials went through this kind of rural exodus. And so those of us that grew up either in the church or in rural context in particular, uh, we were so encouraged to go to college that we then went to college, we went to the city, the cité, whatever it may be, we went to the city and uh, we started to have kids or we started our lives there, we started to get uh, our, our working selves there. And then inevitably there's this age of like 35 that once you hit the year 35, you want to move back home. Not saying it's universal, not saying it's your reality. Millennials are kind of starting to break the trend. But for a lot of Gen Xers and the older millennials, that was very much a reality of like, go to the city, live life, come back home. And so it's a very interesting concept of, of this kind of like being sent. It's almost like a prodigal mentality of where we, we go, we live our lives, and then we come back home. Uh, and I wonder if we're going to continue to see that in the for future iterations of the church. I wonder how Checkpoint will see that. Because we are, we're able to be experienced anywhere, uh, being a digital church. We're able to be experienced in the city or in the rural context. Um, we're able to be experienced literally anywhere across the world. And so what does that mean for us and who we're reaching if we're reaching people that lived a, lived a life that was in the church and are then wanting to return to it? Are we going to be a kind of sense of home that they're going to be able to come back to? Or are we going to find more often than not we're meeting people for the first time? Uh, truly evangelizing to a new people group um, because we're reaching a new place here on Twitch. Interesting thoughts. These are all, these are the thoughts that go through my head 24 seven folks. These are, this is what it means to have a church planner mindset. Just always working through these concepts and reading these books. I met Jesus at a very young age, went to a Christian K-8 grade school, started making decisions to follow Jesus around first grade when I realized the world, will, world was doing something very different in the direction of what scripture laid out and what our religious element of school was teaching. Very interesting. You started to realize that in first grade or was that maybe through, through more discovery and, and perception? If you realized all that in first grade, then it feels like um, you're a genius. Because I'm still learning that truth. 
I'm learning how and why and if and in what ways. Yep, first grade. I'm an odd one. Hey, I love it. I love it. God calls all types at all times. And there's all different places where, where, where this is happening. I think it's great. If you've never, if you've never taken the time, uh, I think that was an important thing. An important thing that we, we talked about in this sermon is take the time. You can even, you can even do a timeline. This is something that we did in seminary, um, but you can take a timeline and literally draw out the path of your life and try and discern where, uh, where God has been, where God has impacted uh, along with that. And so you can take that and give it a shot. And see if you can, if you don't have a testimony or if you don't feel like you have a powerful testimony or something that you're able to share. If somebody said like, why do you like Jesus? If you don't have an answer for that, that's a ha helpful practice um, to literally draw out a timeline and to say, this is like the moment. This is where it happened. Kind of like how I've been doing slowly throughout this stream, right? I started in a Christian camp. I went through this reaffirmation process over and over and over again until it took. Uh, and so that's something that like you can, you can, pinpoint these moments in your life where you've seen God working and then you're able to draw out a story whenever somebody asks. Helpful practice. Started taking it seriously around my teenage years. It's been a very stressful journey since it is. The burden is easy, the yoke is light, but the way is also narrow. These things can both be true. The idea of folks being sent to the city, as you said, is so real. One of my wife's focuses at her job is young adult ministry, and it's a struggle. I think that's what makes the digital church so important. Young adults in the city have a difficult have a difficulty fitting traditional church schedules in their lives and seem to come back when lives settle down. Digital church is on demand and provides these connections. I agree. I think it's a way of continuing the connection beyond uh, in those years. It is interesting seeing how foundations, religious or Christianity, are built from a young age versus becoming a Christian as an adult. Yes. Yes. Discipleship. Discipleship starts very young in the church. And we have we have generations of folks that were not discipled <laughs> or were discipled wrongly, right? Uh, were, were really uh, not read the Bible, but read ideas. Um, not taught theology, but instead kind of either thought, taught theodicy or taught ideas that are uh, conflicting with whatever. Um, I think that currently we're in a really weird trend of, of, of religiosity and um, bipartisanship being a little too integrated. And so, and, I, and I'm saying this on all sides of the spectrum. Uh, it's, it's really tricky though. I will say I was more judgmental before I became a parent. Um, once I became a parent, it did become very clear. Now, granted, my kids are still very young. And so the stuff we're teaching them is, is super basic and fun and exciting at this point. But once the tougher conversations are going to start happening, like I get it. Um, no longer do I judge. Shouldn't have judged to begin with. <laughs> but I, I, I will humbly confess that I did used to judge people uh, in that way. I used to judge parents more harshly than I ought. And... Um, Maybe you're like that too. So hear from me that once you become a parent or if you become a parent, um, you will have a different perspective and you'll know that it is more challenging than we give it credit for. More challenging than we give credit for. Especially when work is already being done. So we send our, um, we send our three-year-old to a Catholic daycare and um, it's interesting. It's very interesting. The things that are being taught that I have no like say, right? Uh, there are things that I can I can correct or course correct if the need be. So far, nothing's been so egregious that I feel the need to course correct. But like eventually, there might be there might be a cause for concern. You know, there might be a time where we have to really have a hard conversation. I don't think they're they're um, pushing too much about saints. Which granted, the Methodists we have a pretty high episcopacy for 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 saints and for uh, you know all that stuff. Um, but. It's going to be an interesting day. It's going to be an interesting day whenever uh, Nora comes to me and wants to talk about, like, Mother Mary. And I'll be like, Mary was important. <laughs> and we'll just have to leave it there. Uh, everything is easy, and you can think what you want mentality has infiltrated culture so deeply, it's hard to even do discipleship in a biblical manner. 
or to be taught it in a way that's engaging. I think that's why I really like the Bible Project. Um, they do a really good job of making it very engaging and interesting. And so you're able to tackle these challenging ideas and these challenging pieces of scripture um, without just having to throw them into your devotional time. You're able to actually like, you're able to, you're able to exegete. We have, I was never taught to exegete uh, until I got to seminary. The fact that seminary was the first time I ever heard the word exegete is not okay. Like that's, that's the issue is that we're, we're, we're bypassing a whole concept of scripture. We're told Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. That's not enough. Like that's, you know, whatever. If you like that phrase, don't like that phrase. It's not enough. Regardless, if you're just saying Bible says it, I believe it. That settles it. That's not taking it to the step of like Bible says it. I worked through it. I challenged it. I wrestled with it. Wait, what is that? Have you ever heard that phrase before? That's a very popular Christianese thing that people will say whenever they don't want to argue. They just want to settle it. They just want to stop the argument. Um, during Bible discussions, they'll just say, well, Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. You'll see bumper stickers like this in the South that say that on it. And um, yeah, it's just not enough. It's simply not enough. Everything, everything is worthy of our time and our attention. Oh, exe exegesis. Sure, sure, sure. So exegesis is the process by which we break apart scripture. So it is the analysis of scripture word by word using the original Hebrew and Greek text, um, using themes, counter context. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just, it's just a matter of really breaking down each individual verse, each individual idea. Teaching critical thinking is also difficult to do when you get to a certain maturity. Sure. Got a lurk? All good, Wandering Knight. Thanks for your combo today. Appreciate you. Hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday. But yes, so exegesis, the process by which we break apart scriptures. Um, a lot of people will start that work in commentaries, and you can. If you've never read a commentary before, that's certainly a way to do it. Um... The way we were taught in seminary was to literally break down each word and to find all the references in Strong's Dictionary. And so you can take you can take each individual word in Scripture and you can find where else it has been counter-referenced. A great resource is Blue Letter Bible. Um, BlueLetterBible.com will allow you to go Scripture by Scripture, find words, click on that word in the original Hebrew or Greek, and then it'll draw out all the times that this particular verbiage of this word has been used. Very helpful. Very helpful, especially whenever you find keywords that don't make sense or things that are challenging to you. You're able to explore them and exegete them properly. I'm personally of the of the body of belief that I don't think exegesis can be done totally alone. I think it can start alone, but inevitably it has to happen in conversation and in community. Um, I think that we're called to community. We're called to the body of Christ and we're called to hear from different perspectives and different types. And so if we're doing exegesis by ourselves, we're also not doing exegesis well enough. That's a part of the reason why the Bible says that I believe that that settled is, is not enough um, because we shouldn't settle anything without having conversation, without engaging. Um, yeah. There's a lot that I can say about this. There's a lot that can be said about this. It's part of the reason why these, um, why these nerdy sermons are so important, I think. Uh, and that's that I make them so that doesn't sound very humble, but I think that they're spirit led. And I think that what's, what's vital about them is that we're taking themes and ideas that we do understand, right? We all understand our favorite horror show. We all understand our favorite anime. We all understand our favorite video game. And so by taking ideas and concepts from them, exegeting the scripture alongside them and connecting ideas and concepts that overlap, we're able to thus further understand scripture through things that we already understand. It's the whole reason that I do it. If it weren't for that, there's no reason for these nerdy sermons to exist. And for this nerd ministry to exist, to be quite honest. That's why whenever people are like, oh, you just do, what, so sermons are, your sermons are just video game reviews? It's like, no, no. Mm -mm. No, I'm doing something much more important there. <laughs> I'm trying to connect these ideas and break them down uh, in a way that is hopefully adequate. Sometimes better than others. But this idea, hopefully, Hopefully this sermon helped you reperceive the concept of the testimony. 
and of the story that we tell. Maybe you've never heard that a testimony is for others or that a testimony is for Jesus. Those are two things that we're often not told. Our story, this is my story, this is my song, right? We have this kind of concept of this is my thing, this is my experience. But the reality of the testimony is that it's actually an echo of Jesus in you that you share with others. So it's, it's saying, here are the hallmark moments where I found Jesus in my life. Let me share that with you so that you might be able to meet the Jesus that works in me. Because not everybody's going to find the, another person's Jesus to be the one that, that helps make the connection for them. Not saying there are multiple Jesuses, but there are multiple you. And we're all part of the body of Christ. Right? The hand cannot say to the foot, I have no need of you. We need all types. We need all testimonies. Um, we need all experiences of Jesus because somebody's going to really resonate with that experience and say, maybe this Jesus is for me. We've got two minutes left. Any last minute burning questions? Any last minute thoughts that we want to drop before we go find somebody to raid? I appreciate all of you hanging out. This has been super fun. Really good conversation. I so appreciate the good conversation that everybody's been engaging with and talking about. We're here every Wednesday with these. So we'll be back next Wednesday at nine o'clock. Hey, Nerd Pastor Nate, dropping in with a whole different discipleship maturity question. If you want to save it for later, I understand. Did you ever have or have you dealt with the I'm 18 so I can ignore or disregard my parents and do what I want mentality? I have a three-year-old. Some days it feels like she's 18, but I feel like I probably can't adequately weigh in. I was a youth minister for several years. Um, and what I what I found about uh, the teenage and the especially the like right at the adult onset is kind of what I talked about earlier. And I don't think you were here, Hunter fam. Um, but we've been, we're raised and we've been discovering this natural proclivity to go. Um, you can think of it as like a prodigal, maybe not quite as dramatic or as negative as the prodigal. Uh, but we're, we're, we're taught, right? And we're, we have a natural and a nurtural reaction to leave. And so what we're finding, this is not necessarily true with Gen Z because they just haven't had the time to do the study, but Gen X and millennials, they all left and then they come back. So there's this concept of like, you leave, you go to the city, you go to college, you go to start your family, you go to start your job, you go to do your initial things, you live life to the fullest. Uh, and then somewhere around the age of like 30, 35, you come back to your rural communities. This is in my rural studies that I did this. You come back to your rural communities, you come back to your home. Uh, that's what we found for a long time. But to be dealing with somebody that is at the age of 18, people either have such a strong resonance with faith and it's so personally grounded that they don't have that trouble or the opposite is concerned and they don't have that strong grounding or they don't have that strong feeling in and of their own self. Maybe it's because they're rooted in somebody else. Maybe it's because they're rooted in their church. Maybe it's because they're, they're, they have their faith rooted in something other than in Jesus, but in, in some kind of teaching that they've been taught rather than in a personal relationship. And so the 18 year old is trying to figure out like, where do I stand? And so I, I, it could feel like an ignoring, and it could be ignoring, but odds are it's staking a claim. Uh, it's saying that I'm I'm 18, I'm an adult now, and I'm going to stake my claim. I'm going to start to make feelings and discipleship decisions for myself. So that could be helpful. That could not be helpful. I don't have an 18 year old, so thankfully I'm not there yet, but I will one day, I'll have two of them. Uh, and that's going to be a challenge that I'm sure we'll deal with and wrestle with. I did talk a little bit about parenting um, and about how I used to judge parents that didn't raise their kids, uh, you know, whatever, however I objectively saw uh, faith should be done. But now that I'm a parent, I realize that that was unfair and that that was totally wrong of me. I repent. I repent of my judgmental nature um, because uh, it's really tough. It's really tough to enter these conversations. And there's a lot of voices being heard at once. And so, yeah, my life, I'll do my thing. I think that's, that is a, that is a phrase that behind the phrase is I'm trying to figure out what is my thing. I want to know what is my thing. Uh, I want to explore what is my thing. And that's where I was, at least whenever I was 18. Um, I still was running away from the faith at 18. I was still not necessarily the faith, but I was still running away from my calling as a pastor. Um, yeah, I was still wanting to be everything other than that. 
I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be a voice actor. I wanted to make video games. I wanted to do literally anything other than what my dad did. I did not want to be a pastor. And um, I just had to figure out what, what, is, what is my thing. My thing is reaching you guys. Um, my thing is reaching nerds, geeks, and gamers. And so I had to figure out what is my calling, what is my particular way of understanding the world, understanding faith and theology. Um, and it took grip, uh, gripping into digital culture. It took gripping into um, an experience of modern evangelism. It took, it took a lot of different things to figure out what was my thing, and it took years. So, yeah. I'll be praying for you, Hunter Fan Mom. I know that feel, um, whether, it's, whether it's your own kiddos or whether it's just kiddos that you know. Yeah. I don't judge the discipleship methods, but discipline and boundaries, I'm a little judgy. It's really tough. It's really tough. It's tough not to judge, and it's tough once you're in it to feel like others are judging you and to know that some are and some aren't. Um, but I try my best to assume the best and then work as hard as I can in my own. Because if I'm focused too much on others, I'm not focused on my own. And I gotta, I gotta, I gotta focus on my kids because <laughs> they need it and I need it uh, and I need the time and the energy. All right, folks, we're going, we're going past time, but I so appreciate this last minute, last minute question, Hunter fam. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Thank you all for being here and for tuning in folks. We're checkpoint church for the nerd church for nerds, geeks, and gamers. We're doing this Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, every other Friday, every Wednesday, we have our faith conversations like this. Um, but we obviously I'm an open book. If you guys have questions throughout the week, ask me, but this is just our intentional time. We enter into this space with a, with a song. We watch our sermon together. We, we, this is a time for engaging in this kind of spiritual conversation. And we do this intentionally every Wednesday. Um, but I'm willing to, I'm willing to dabble in it the rest of the time. We will be back again tomorrow, nine o'clock Eastern. Uh, we'll continue playing through Beacon Pines. I gotta know. I gotta know where this story goes. So we'll be back with that tomorrow at nine o'clock Eastern. And uh, we're going to go raid somebody right now. Folks, regardless of whether or not you go to church, don't go to church, believe in God, don't believe in God, have a testimony. I haven't quite figured it out. Regardless of any of those things, we believe three things to be true about every single one of you out there. Number one, we believe that God loves you, like really, really loves you. Number two, we love you. We want community with you. That's what we're doing here on our Twitch, Discord, and YouTube. And number three, we believe that you, yes, you matter. You are a person of sacred worth. The world is a better place. Why? Because you are in it. Folks, with that, we're going to go and raid Love Thy Nerd, of course. And uh, go drop some You Matters in the chat. And uh, yeah, we'll go and see what Frost is up to. It looks like he's playing Marvel Snapped, which I'm also obsessed with right now. So I wish I had some kind of fun clip. But yeah, go drop some You Matters, folks. I look forward to seeing you hopefully over in the Discord right now or tomorrow. Till then, bye bye